we're going to do a, a little bit of a different sort of, of talk this year than what we've given the last few years. In the past, we've kind of mainly focused on uh, writing for the Mises Wire, which we still you know, always encourage our Mises U alums to do. And uh, Ryan will go in a little bit deeper on you know, exactly what we're looking for uh, in terms of writing production. Um, but we're also going to talk more broadly about other ways to apply the ideas that you learn from Mises U you know, you know, out in the real world. I mean, I, th I think one of the great things about Mises U is that we don't only attract people looking to become you know, economic scholars, uh, but from people from you know, all different backgrounds with different interests and different skill sets. And so we're just going to kind of touch upon some of our own experiences uh, and ways that we can kind of you know, utilize what we have learned this past week uh, out to make a, a more freer and prosperous world. Um, so with that being said, I'll let Ryan talk a little bit about the website and, and some of his background as a Mises U alum himself. Uh, I like how we uh, use the term real world as basically the opposite of academia. I, I guess that's, that's a slight insult to only professional academics. But... Between real world and clown world. What you is, can do? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so I, I guess we'll just cover as kind of a preface the whole writing thing. Um, so I am uh, the editor of Mises.org. And so if you do find yourself wanting to write anything for it, you should just send it directly to me. Uh, don't go through the whole like form that they've got. There's somewhere on the side where you click on it and they have to fill in a form and says, just send it to me. You want to send it to R.W. McMakin at Mises, is, which is uh, uh, derived from my name, which is Ryan <laughs> at Mises. My middle initial is W, so R.W. McMakin at Mises.org is where you would send any submissions that you would wish to have evaluated for use on Mises.org. Uh, and I will send you back uh, a critique if I don't if I don't think it's publishable. I uh, I spend many years grading papers, so I do have a sense of how to tell you what you can do to improve uh, your submission. So I, unless I just think there's no way to um, to fix it uh, to to run, and then I'll just send you know I don't think it's a good fit for Mises Org. Maybe next time. Uh, but in a lot of cases, I do want to I want to cultivate writers. Right? I want people who maybe start out not as great, but within a few tries, they become regular contributors. And that has happened. We've got some people now who regularly submit articles, and at the beginning, they weren't that good. Uh, but they're good now, and I like that. So again, do not take criticism as a bad thing. The, the entire goal is to try to make you improve as a writer so you became a, become a more useful asset for the Institute and uh, in, in helping us spread the ideas that we all care about. Yeah, and that's really all you need to know is just send it to me, and um, I'll let you know how what you need to do with it uh, to get it published. Uh, but definitely please read the uh, article guidelines for submission and that sort of thing. So you have a sense of how long it should be and how you should submit it um, and just the format and so on, right? Because people send me PDFs and then I have to like, if I want to edit it, I got to ask for a different format and all of that stuff. So don't do that because that just, just annoys me and adds time to the day and not that that would prevent you from getting published, just um, that's, it's just be nice. So just follow the rules of, uh, so anywhere in my bio, it says, read this first if you want to submit an article. So just go to my bio. Again, my name is Ryan McMakin, uh, and uh, it will tell you then uh, how to do that. So that's really, that's it. That's it on writing. And there's some lessons that, that you can take away from the Liberty Pitch competition, right? You know, under, understand your audience that you're writing for. You know, we've got an, you know, a form kind of lay audience uh, more than, than a, pure, a purely academic audience. Understand your own limitations, right? You know, a lot of people in this room are not going to be able to completely design some, some brilliant, unique insight into economic theory. Uh, but there's all sorts of ways where we can build upon the shoulders of those you know, that, that have come before us to apply economic theory in the real world in ways that can be educational. Um, so again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, just you know, you can you know, use quotes from Mises and Rothbard and, and Joe Salerno and find little things that are going on in the news cycle and your community. Um, in, in, if there's an area that uh, of research or or you know, you know, if you're, if you're an undergrad in, in engineering and you see some sort of interesting application uh, that touches on Austrian concepts, uh, these are things to build on um, because, again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and, and, and you know, churn out a treatise to, to provide some really valuable information on how we should better, better see the world.
Yeah, what I do is Mises Wire, which is not the quarterly journal of Austrian economics. You send that to Joe Salerno or maybe Mark Thornton, and then they'll do that for you. That'll be your world-changing, long article. My stuff's like stuff that would go in a newspaper, except better. Um, because stuff that runs in newspapers, it's usually too simple. Our, we have a fairly sophisticated audience, uh, so it's something you would send to like your local Courier Telegraph or whatever probably isn't appropriate for the site. Although I would encourage you write those things too, uh, but just read a lot of the site and, and get a sense of what we like and what's run and uh, who's and imagine in your head who's reading it, and then you can do that. But I would ask you this though: what if what if writing isn't something someone likes doing? Writing isn't for everybody, of course. So what sh what else should someone consider doing? Uh, it was all sorts of ways. Uh, one, and you know, given that we are living in in the internet age, uh, I think memes are a great way of transmitting these ideas. Um, yeah, this is something I, I have personally enjoyed over the last few years. Uh, and I've, I've written an article on why Mises would understand meme magic. The idea being that, you know, if we understand the power of ideas within a society, you know, memes are a language of transmitting ideas using images and, and, and humor and formatting. Um, you know, it's, if you talk to a lot of international libertarians, it's always interesting how often you'll turn up on someone whose first introduction to libertarianism was actually a meme. Um, so again, you don't have to write an 800 word article if you've got a sense of humor and uh, you know, basic operations of Photoshop. Um, you, know, you can be a part of the ideological battle in that way. Um, there's other ways of you know, just being in your community, um, you know, being a, someone that people in your community look for um, you know, that respect their, your, your opinion. Um, I think one thing that you know, Ryan and I have, have talked about it this week, um, but the one piece of advice I'd give every single you know, libertarian who's interested in actually making a difference, we talk about decentralization and thinking locally all the time. Uh, it also applies to local history. You know, if, if anyone in this room goes back home and reads 10 hours worth of local history, right? You don't have to do it all in one day. You know, you could take two weeks doing this. Find your local library. There's usually some interesting stuff. All of a sudden, you're a local history guy. And if you're 22 years old using Facebook to talk about interesting gems that have happened in the history of your community, uh, then other people, business leaders, if you can run your social networks appropriately, uh, people value people that have interest in where, where they're living. And I think, you know, I think older people particularly like to see that from young people. Um, so you know, by, by spending a little bit of time uh, you know, taking our appreciation for economic history, for the roles that ideas play in, in shaping the world that we live in, you know, applying some of these lenses in a very micro level to your own community, talking about that is a way of not only you know, expanding your own knowledge about where you were, you know, where you come from, um, but a way of building kind of social capital amongst people because it's, it's being able to find you know, professionals in your community that respect you as an individual is one of the best ways of getting them to respect the ideas that you hold, uh, because the people matter uh, when it comes to the war of ideas. Just simply being right you know, only goes so far if people don't respect you as an individual talking about it. So let's say, though, I am, I'm 24 years old, I just finished a master's degree in something, or I'm 22 years old and I just finished my bachelor's degree. So I don't want to go on to my, I got my master's, I don't want to get my PhD, or I got my bachelor's, I don't want to get a master's. Uh, what should I do now? What could I do that's of value? Are you saying that I should go back to my local community and become involved there somehow? I'll say that it, it is not the worst case scenario. Um, you know, you're, you're being a, a professional in all, you know, no matter where you end up, um, being a professional, being someone within your community that, wh whether it's your hometown or a new town um, that, that you're now living in after college, uh, you know, being successful is one of the best ways of being an effective communicator of these ideas. Uh, I know a few years ago, Jeff Dice gave a talk in San Diego where he talked about this. You know, if we as, in, as libertarians be one improved unit, um, you know, building off of some of Harry Brown's work, you know, that's one of the most effective ways of, of fighting this battle for ideas. Because again, we have, we as individuals, our own accomplishments do matter in, in all of this. Um, so are you saying that being an unemployed ex-con living in a trailer is perhaps not the most effective yes, way probably to... probably not, uh, not enhance your, your social capital and, and make you someone that people look for, uh, you know, look, look for advice when it comes to Austrian business cycle theory. 
or uh, people are more willing to listen to a successful business owner than to someone who lives under a bridge. I, I think most 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 people, yes. Okay, that's an interesting point of view yes. because most most libertarians I talk to seem to relish being as poor as humanly possible. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people, they, 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 they prefer, and, and I, I think that you know, when it comes to how we manage our social connections, this is really important, right? There's a lot of libertarian activists in the world that their entire sense of self-worth seems to be grounded in the way that they are viewed within this libertarian social media community. And I, I find this very toxic, right? Because then it becomes about purity tests. It becomes about, you know, are, are you poking the wrong, you know, the right people? For this, for your in-group thing, you know, we we, have, we are obviously, you know, you're, you're all. I think just about everyone here is, is younger than I am, but you know, we have been raised in a, a internet culture um, where you know social networks have been a big part of our life. There's value in that, but we we shouldn't isolate ourselves to a libertarian ghetto. Again, the the people around you. Uh, your your family members, your your work your colleagues, you know those people have a lot more importance on your day to day life than your reputation within libertarian social media Inc. Right? Um, and I, I see far too often people get wrapped up into that drama when you know this doesn't matter to most people. And at the end of the day, these ideas matter because not just simply because they're purer on a libertarian spectrum, it's because they are important in the world that we live in. Um, so we shouldn't get distracted uh, by that. We should be looking for ways of actually making a difference on a day-to-day -day basis in the communities that we live in. So this is something that's changed in my thinking over the years. I know that I'm not sure it's been entirely constructive for a lot of uh, people, especially involved kind of in the more hardcore anarcho-capitalist group to really emphasize uh, that it's a bad thing to become involved in local politics or that it's a bad thing to ever vote. Um, I was more like that and then I got older and then the state where I live, Colorado, switched over to mail-in ballots almost entirely and they uh, kept sending me ballots. And I would open it and it would say, vote yes or no, do you want this tax to be increased? And I thought, well, shouldn't I vote no on this and, and send it back in? So I started doing that. So then they got me. So then I started voting again, mostly to just vote down tax increases, right? And then I started realizing that uh, some of these people running for office were especially horrible. So I thought I should at least vote against this person. So the so next thing I know, I'm like voting for state legislature people and all of that stuff. But then I realized, would it really be the end of the world if we started having some people in the state legislature who aren't just the worst human beings imaginable? And uh, so, so now I, I actually participate in that stuff. And I don't think it was the worst decision ever. I think it's okay to know what your county commission is doing. And also, I think one of the, the good things that happened out of this whole lockdown, stay-at-home order thing is that people realized that it matters who's on your city council and who's on your county government and who's your sheriff and uh, who's in the state legislature. Because in my state, if you just had a few more people in the state legislature actually thought maybe there was something wrong with the whole stay at home order lockdown system, they might have been able to force a vote, uh, a resolution that might have brought the emergency period to an end. If you had just a few more people on county commissioners who weren't totally bonkers on this issue, they might have been able to prevent some lockdown orders and that sort of thing. And uh, it's not, not like all of these people are wannabe, uh, I, I don't know, Condoleezza Rice's or uh, Hillary Clinton's of the world. A lot of these are just part-time people who aren't particularly even that interested in politics. They just kind of ended up on the city council because... Uh, somebody encouraged them to do it. A lot of the time, it's just completely part-time, and it doesn't pay much in many cases. Uh, but I, I, I want to say it's okay to uh, probably maybe try and get some of the less bad people in these positions, especially if the next time something like this happens, that maybe we'll be better prepared and realize that the next time you vote for governor, it's not just something about, oh, you know, governors so boring, right? They, 
It's just a matter of like school funding or some issue having to do with where are we going to put a new county road or something like that. Now we all recognize that who's your governor is you're basically voting on who's going to be the next dictator if there's some sort of health emergency. And will this person completely destroy your life by closing your business? That sort of thing strikes me as fairly important, the sort of thing we would want to pay attention to. And you can certainly have a lot more say over those, those sorts of things if you're actually paying attention and also not living under a bridge. Yes. And in sheriffs in particular, we've seen you know, all sorts of very interesting trends throughout the country, it often focus on, on enforcement of gun control laws. Uh, I know in Washington state, you had this major cultural clash between um, you know, see, you know, you know, what, what's happening on, on, in the big cities relative to the more rural areas where you had a lot of sheriffs in eastern Washington state that said that you know, they refused to enforce a lot of these gun control laws uh, that are being pushed by the state government that's far more progressive than the people in their communities. I guess the example of nullification within a state, you know, focusing on local government, um, you know, really can play an important role in, in again, this decentralized political uh, effort um, you know, push back against a lot of this stuff. Also, uh, schools, uh, school boards is one area where you can have influence on getting uh, things in the curriculum. Um, you know, you can, if, if you're able to get economics in one lesson in the hands of 300 students in your county, and, and the Mises Institute, is, has, thanks to our donors, is making economics in one lesson available for free. Um, you can sign up for that at Mises.org slash one lesson. Um, our entire purpose is to try to send people throughout the country and throughout the world free copies of economics in one lesson to hand out. Uh, because again, a lot of these areas, you know, a lot of, of school curriculums, the, the way that teach economics is no, no better than they do in universities. Um, and, but you know, there, there's a lot, especially in conservative areas right now where people are kind of waking up to my God, you know, look at the products of the education system that we have. You know, these are now the people tearing down statues. You're seeing a lot of conversation at that grassroots level on exactly what are we teaching our kids? I think this creates a great opportunity for you know, those that provide alternative solutions and the Institute, you know, we've got economics in one lesson. We have Bob Murphy's textbook, a uh, lesson for the young economists that I think is, is a, a remarkable uh, book, uh, particularly if any of you know anyone's homeschooling now with these trends going on. You know, again, Bob Murphy's economics uh, uh, lessons of young economists. Free uh, there's a teacher's guide online. Uh, I think that's a great resource. Um, but again, that, that's you know it, it requires though talking to people in your community that are outside of libertarian social networks um, and kind of making that difference there. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more. I mean, this really is the issue of uh, right. You don't want you don't want to be an academic. You don't like writing particularly. So you don't spend all your day writing stuff on a, for a website. It also saves you the grief of being told what an idiot you are all the time if you put things out there in the public for people to read and so on. Um, and that can be particularly disturbing if you're young. Um, I mean, I'm old. I've been married for 20 years. I got four kids. So when some like incel from somebody's basement tells me, you know, what a stupid sellout I am, whatever. Um, couldn't possibly care less, but uh, I, you know, not everybody wants to open themselves up uh, to that sort of thing. And so it's okay to have a family and influence people just in interpersonal relations. So it's just like a lot of what you're talking about, right? Uh, you can form your own opinions, become an educated person, and just be a person in the community who tells people things uh, when it comes up in conversation. And I can think of many cases where just one or two comments from a person who wasn't any sort of famous person or writer or something impacted me deeply in many cases. And it was just one or two things they said. I didn't even necessarily know this person that well, but just the fact that this person had some opinions and it was a person I respected. And that's the thing I think that so much of it comes down to, we're not really building up our ideologies from the ground up, right? At some point uh, you have to just trust other knowledgeable people and their opinions, because uh, if you get cancer, right, and I know you're, you might research it somewhat, so you're somewhat educated on it, but you probably don't have the time uh, and the background necessary to just uh, completely rebuild oncology from nothing in order to come to your, your opinion about what is correct in this topic. You, you got to find someone whose opinion you find respectable and, and just kind of wing it from there. That's what we're all doing, really, when it comes to ideology and our view of history and everything. 
uh, your religious views. In many cases, you just got to find the people whose opinions you think are reliable and valuable. And you can be that person at some point. You can just be, uh, hey, I know this guy and he, he, uh, he owns an insurance firm, nothing sexy, right? But I respect him and he has these views about economics or something, which I, I, think, uh, I think it holds a lot of water and, and that could actually really affect a bunch of people. Not to mention that, of course, obviously, if you have children, uh, you can affect uh, their opinions and ideology. I know that, I know a lot of grown people who are always telling me, usually baby boomers, I guess, who are telling me that their children are terrible now and have all become communists and that sort of thing. <laughs> Um, but I don't know, does that mean the parents are total failures? Maybe things would have been way worse if uh, their, <laughs> their parents had to, had, hadn't tried to impute to them some more sensible values. So I don't know, but I do think there's value to uh, being a parent and trying to pass on your values to your children. And uh, that's how the world is, it does things one person at a time. I meet so many, and I don't meet them either in many cases, I get emails from them or they comment on Mises.org and so on, where, and it's usually older people uh, who have just kind of given up, I guess. And, the, and this is at the heart of what the Mises Institute right, does. The Mises Institute is here to try and build an ideology, to change people's views, to get people to see the world uh, in a certain way, to change their views of history, to get people thinking in a certain way and then pass those values down. This is how schools of thought are built. This is how ideologies are built. These are the building blocks of civilization uh, and the way it works in terms of when you look out in the world and there are certain ideologies that control the world right now, those ideologies came from a specific place, from specific thinkers, from people who wrote books, from who taught children and all that sort of stuff. And the people who control that right now had a very long-term plan in place. I mean, they worked for decades to put themselves in positions in academia, to write books, to make movies, uh, to write literature, and they all did it reflecting a certain point of view that now dominates. But I hear so often from uh, people who are probably now in their 60s and 70s and so on, well, I tried for 20 years to um, turn everyone into a laissez-faire, free market liberal, and it didn't work. So obviously this whole changing minds thing is garbage, and I give up, and I'm moving to the middle of nowhere now, and I'm just not even going to talk to anyone anymore. It was a failure. And a leftist, of course, would be like, well, we've been working on this project for 200 years, and it's, you know, keep going. If it takes another 800 years to accomplish our goal, we're going to do it. And we're never going to give up, and we're going to keep writing movies, and we'll keep writing books. Meanwhile, the right-wingers are like, I tried for a few years, and I failed, so I give up. And you can see that, like, all over the place. They, uh, they don't understand how ideological change works. They expect instant success, um, and they want everything to go their way, or that's it. Forget about it. And uh, if that's our attitude, it is never going to work. You might as well just give up now. I don't even bother if uh, you're, you have a 20-year time horizon. Um, if you're really lucky, when you're 90, you might be able to see some good success there. And uh, that's the Nokian view. That's the Rockwellian view, to refer to Lou, to the, uh, the view of these guys in the 30s. who thought, we need to change minds. We've got a long way to go, and we've got to build it uh, from the ground up. Of course, as I've mentioned in my talk, we already got 200 years of a great ideology. It's called liberalism. And they've said a lot of great things, but we, and that was the most popular ideology in the 19th century. It's not like this ideology could never be popular. Uh, it changed the world in a huge way. And a lot of the benefits we live with now in terms of vibrant economies and what we've got left of private property, a respect for it, it still exists to some extent. We can thank all those people who worked hard in the 19th century to make that happen. Um, but they did their best and it fell out of favor with a lot of people, but that doesn't mean just stop and it, it can never be regained. And I mean, if we, if we believe that there, that's pointless and there's no point to coming to the Mises Institute or, or reading the website or doing anything, just give up now, forget about it. And, uh, I don't know, consume things and eat a lot of food and just avoid death until you die in your bed decades from now. The sound of trumpets blaring. Yeah, all right. Um, another thing is that 
uh, you know, well, I think one of the reasons the left has had so much success is that we've seen the destruction of so many civil institutions that historically have provided different barriers between individuals in, in the state. Right? You, know, you used to have, instead of having a, a centralized welfare state, there were a variety of different private uh, uh, organizations dedicated towards taking care of the community. You know, that that um, one of the big issues we have now is that a lot of these civil society groups, like even the big ones, like the, the Kiwanis Club and the Lions Club, uh, Rotary Club, things like that, you know, they've, they're increasingly older, increasingly smaller. Um, I don't know how successful some of these will be in adapting to the world as it is today. Um, but that, that's another area, though, where you, know, you do have these networks that you can join a part of, become a part of these local uh, legacies. Um, and again, being a young person, and again, this, is, this is one of the great opportunities that we have, is that being a young person who is not a socialist and is actively anti-socialist makes you stand out amongst your peers. And, and people in your community that are willing to, that, that, that care about this stuff, that are looking for causes to donate to, um, to, to help support, you know, because they are now concerned about the future in ways that they might not have been before. You know, you guys now have a massive competitive advantage being here, being interested in these ideas. Um, and it's up to you to really take advantage of it. Um, you know, nothing is stopping you from, from being people within your community that people look up to. You, you've got massive advantages right now that a lot of your peers do not have. Um, and so again, hopefully, and, and, and you're keeping in touch with the people that you've met here this week. Um, it's always great seeing how many people have, have built lasting friendships um, because having that, that social interaction where you can discuss these ideas, you know, broad libertarian social networks might not be valuable, but strong groups of people that you respect can generally discuss ideas are very important. Uh, I know Brian Kaplan's talked about this idea of creating bubbles for yourself. And I think there is some value with that, uh, with that as well, in, you know, not just for social media purpose, but in your actual community. Um, where I'm now privileged because I've brought several friends to Mises U now after the last few years. I've got a lot of uh, 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 professionals that read Mises Wire. You know, I can now sit down and have a conversation at my house with well, I, well, six, seven, or how, however much the government will allow me to have now um, to talk about, you know, to make hoppa jokes, right? And actually having that within my community, be, you know, not, that, that, you know, I don't have to visit Auburn, Alabama for that is, is one of the great uh, uh, you know, it, it, particularly in times where, where things can be really crazy out there. And there's, there's certain weeks this past, past year um, that, that, you know, things are you know, very depressing. Having that social, that, that, that genuine personal social network of support um, is something that I'd, I'd encourage everyone to try to find. Yes, absolutely. Do not neglect your personal life to fight for freedom. Um, you'll end up very sad and lonely and depressed. So you definitely want to make sure and you build a social network that you have a support system, that you have a normal life uh, that isn't just, you know, I'm, I'm writing columns, I'm hanging out online, talking to people on social media, and that is not a rewarding uh, way to go through life. You do need actual people in physical space that you can maybe touch on occasion and see face to face and get together and maybe even not talk about politics at all. And, that's sometimes very nice uh, break. And I've known too many people who've uh, spent their lives uh, writing and making great contributions to the cause of building civilization, but um, you, you get beyond a certain point and uh, you start asking, is that, that all there is? And it's of course not all there is, although it's a very good and important thing. And uh, I don't want this to sound too much like I'm giving out advice, right? I, I'm not telling you how exactly to do this. I'm just saying that uh, um, I, I don't want to give people the impression that if you're not writing columns for Mises.org or writing books or doing these things or constantly preaching uh, that you're, you're not doing it right. That you, know, you deserve a break, you deserve maybe, and it doesn't even have to be at all times in your life, right? Maybe you need to take 10 years off to devote to just your family or something like that, and you don't go to any conferences. I, I had a 10-year period where I didn't come down here at all, even though I've been loosely affiliated with the Mises Institute long before I ever worked here, and because I had a bunch of little kids, and, and my wife got annoyed if I just left home, and she had like toddlers there. So uh, yeah, I had other, other values to consider for, for a period. Um, and uh, I, I just often, I just, I hear often from people who I think are um, 
they, they haven't been given permission in many cases by free market activists and so on to do other things. Uh, but I, I think you actually end up doing more good for the movement in general by building up your life and be, becoming a, a person and influential within your own community. Um, that being said, I think that we're, we're at 12.30, so I think we're going to call it. But if you've got any questions, we're always happy to answer and, and talk between uh, now and the rest of the day.